so let me recap what happened um, last time. So if S is an affine uh, derived scheme, and we are working under the almost finite type assumption, so we said that there is this category quasi co of S, and it, be it can be recovered from the subcategory of its, of its compact objects, and the latter is perf. So then we also introduced this category. Let me write it here. So the fact that uh, there were some statements you have made at uh, the end of last time, and then you said something that they are not true or that they are not true. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat. I, so I didn't quite understand this part. I don't. Uh... Yeah, I'll repeat what's relevant. So this was the end completion of the category of coherent complexes. And we always have a functor that I denote psi. It's the functor, it's the end extension of the embedding of coherent into quasi-coherent. And so, so if S is what we call eventually co-connective, co-connective, and that means just that the structure sheaf has finitely many cohomologies. In this case, the functor, so psi has a left adjoint. And this left adjoint is um, just the embedding of perf into co. So this assumption tells you that the structure sheaf is coherent, and so you can embed perf into co. So that was one thing that we said. So additionally, we said that if no, this is completely evident. Um, so one thing is it's easy to see that perf is indeed compact. And the only thing to check is that quasico was compactly generated. But it's easy to see, it's just, it's just generated by O. I mean, for things. Yeah, this was a fine. Ah, only for alpha. Yeah, so this is. This was. Could you mention this paper uh, of uh, Bundle? Bundle? Uh, yeah, 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 so this was. A, I did not. I looked, but it didn't seem to be in the context <laughs> that you are speaking about, but. Yeah. It didn't have the right. So, we don't need this, any of this. So we'll. We do it for affine, and then we cover everything by affines. So we don't need any of the non-trivial facts about non-affine schemes. So now if, let's write it here. So if S is eventually co-connective, sorry, quasi-smooth, So we can introduce intermediate categories, namely for every n, which is a conical Zariski closed subset inside this thing that we call thing, we can define the category ind co n of s, which was by definition ind of co n. And this sits in between. So it's related by a pair of adjoint functors like so. And we're going to use these functors today. OK, that was one thing we did. That was if you, roughly the first part of the lecture. And the second part of the lecture, we talked about pre-stacks and stacks. So let me give you a digest of what happened. Okay, I think the position gets three adjoint functors, not just two. Yes, there are three, but the third is a bad guy. It's not continuous. Yeah, we, we don't consider these things unless really necessary. So functors that don't commute with arbitrary direct sums are, for reasons that I will actually mention in the detail of the next lecture, are are bad guys for the kind of operations that we will be performing. So I'm trying to stay away from them at least, at least, 
unless I really have to. Okay, so the second part of lecture, we said that if y is a pre-stack, we can attach to it a category quasi-coherent sheaves of y by taking the limit over affines that map to y. And this category, we don't have much control over it. We can define perfect complexes as the, exact, the same way, limit of perfects. But it's not true that in this case that perfects will be compact in here. It's not true anymore for arbitrary pre-stacks. So uh, we also said that if y is an algebraic stack, instead of taking all affines that map to y, it's enough to map those affine, to take those affines that map smoothly. And also, if y is algebraic, you can also assign to y int co, but the same procedure is to limit over affine, map, affine schemes that map to y smoothly of int co of them. And moreover, if, if y is quasi-smooth, so, um, yeah, let me mention, so it's offers question. Uh, it is, it's isomorphic actually to end of co if, uh, y is quasi-compact compact with affine stabilizers. And if it's quasi-smooth, for every um, n inside sing of y, you can again attach the category int co n of y, again by the same procedure, limit over affine schemes, schemes that map smoothly to y, and all of these schemes are quasi-smooth themselves because y was quasi-smooth. So, and again, to comment on what Offer was asking me about, co n is compact there, in intco, but um, not known to generate in general. But and even for n the full sing s when we get quasi cough, right? Yeah, so it's not if n is all of sing, yeah. then it equals this. Yeah. Then well oh, yeah. then the assertion follows from here, but if n is zero... Ah, but we can we, explain it. So it means that you have really plenty of coherent shifts on this step, which is a priori not clear, yeah? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's maybe, it's, maybe some kind of close, close... No, it's easy to, it's easy to construct them. Yeah. Okay. No, so in the first statement, uh, this int code, so in any case, for, for nice stacks, in fact, we call it some more general, there are several things about this, so without the higher, uh, just usual out in stack, so, yes. so a quasi coherent, so one can approximate a quasi coherent shapes by coherent shape. So that's by, in the Italian case, yes, it's yes, quite yes. easy yeah. to do it. And so here you are in the Italian case yeah, yeah. already. So, so, is, so what you are saying about comparing in co and end of co, does it go much beyond this approximation argument? Or? Yes, yes, there is one essential thing that one needs to prove. I don't want to, I wasn't planning to go here in this talk, but let me just say once, it's a kind of cool theorem that if under this assumption, so what you have to prove is that the functor of global sections um, is continuous. So it's IE O is, um, Well, yes, and it's not obvious. It's not just a basic property of shift cohomology and quasi compact and quasi separate. Uh, yeah, but we are stacks, and it's it's not obvious because cohomology is a limit 
in general, and it's you have to commute a limit with a co-limit, and it's not gra it's not it not come. Those are the unbounded guys. Yeah. So the problem is at negative infinity. So you have to bound. So, but more is true is is actually of bounded cohomological dimension. And and and, and is there a counterexample without a fine stabilizers like B of and Um I'm forgetting. It's it is in our paper with Drinfeld. I'm forgetting if there's if there is a counterexample. It's a paper of Drinfeld and myself. I'm just blanking. There is there is a counterexample when the the stabilizers are not affine. I'm forgetting what is the, the counterexample to. My pleasure. Okay, so let me just. So there was a bit technical discussion. Let me just say that this is what we know. But for y being equal to log cis, uh, it will be true that for any n uh, int co n of y is compactly generated. And do you know that the compact objects are exactly yes. co n y in general? Or? Yeah, yes, in general. Yes, in, we always know that these are the compacts. Ah, okay. Is, maybe, let me say the compacts generated by see I can imagine for many people all the discussion about compacts and compacts is boring but for somebody who's lived in it for a long time it's very kind of I wake up at night and think about compactness of objects is there a way to do the theory? So, in, like, in number theory, usually we make one needs cohomology only, one needs only bounded things, and here it seems that unbounded cohomologies are essential. Yes. Uh, is there a way to, oh, okay, maybe, is there a way to somehow just formulate things just for bounded things, or there is no way? So, kind of no, and that's why I did this end. And I, we'll see some more evidence of, for this. As I said last, in my previous lecture, if, for a compactly generated category, the datum of C is equivalent to the datum of it compacts objects. On the one hand, compact objects retain all the information. But when, once you start considering functors, like for example, you have a left adjoint that sends compacts to compacts, but the right adjoint will not normally send compacts to compacts. And it becomes very inconvenient to restrict yourself just to uh, this category is compact objects. So for that reason, I really kind of want to incomplete. So that it's technical, but it's, remember I said this about negative numbers. So it's like five minus seven, and you, you don't want to be saying five minus seven, you want to say minus two. And passing this incompletion is like saying, okay, I'll have the negative numbers and I'll just work with them. All right. Okay. So, but now time has come to discuss this guy log cis. So, what is it? Uh, so, let me give a definition. So, before I do the definition of log cis, let me first define bang G. Uh, what I'll say now is not at all surprising. It's kind of routine, but let me just go through it nonetheless. More generally. Suppose I have a target stack Y and a source stack X. In this case, I can consider the pre-stack of maps from X to Y. And by definition, it's defined so that home from S to the mapping stack is home from S times X to Y. No surprises here, but so this is partly one, why one wants pre-stacks. In general, these guys will not be algebraic stacks or anything, but it's just very convenient to have them because even though they're just arbitrary pre-stacks, you still can 
calculate tangent and cotangent spaces to them, you don't want to discard them. They're convenient to have. So Bungi is by definition the mapping stack from your whatever you're taking Bungi on to the classifying stack of the group. Okay, this is what Bungi is. Now let me say what log sys is. So for this, it's, in, it's convenient to introduce yet another guy. Again, no surprises here, but it's very convenient language. So if you have any pre-stack x, in this case my x will be the curve on, with which I'm working, to it I'll attach another pre-stack called x -derom. Namely, home from s, from a test scheme S to x derom is by definition home from S reduced to x. So this realizes Grothendieck's idea of crystals. So one application of this definition is the following. Um, we will not really go into it right now, but let me just mention. So it's, it's, okay. You can, we defined quasi co for an arbitrary pre stack. In particular, we can take it for x derom. The claim is that this is nothing else but d modules. Okay, it's, it becomes a theorem of content with content if you know what d modules are. We know what d modules are on smooth schemes, in which case it becomes a theorem. So if x is a singular scheme, so how do you define d modules? You go to this nightmare of first defining for affine via Kashiwara's theorem and then gluing. Don't do it, define it this way and then prove Kashiwara's theorem in this context. So this gives you kind of uh, one shot definition. So is it the derived category? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So of the category of d modules with quasi coherent cohomology or no, no, no. quasi coherent d modules on the one single one? What is it if you just want to work classically? So X is a singular algebraic variety, let us say. You, you want singular or non-singular? Non-singular. Uh, okay, so let me let's let so here is the statement. Assume that X is affine, okay? Then we'll risk a glue. Yes. In this case, so okay, just to answer Ofer's question. So um, if x is f is affine, so d mod is, is the following. Is the full subcategory of d mod on some x tilde with supports on x. Yeah, I'll say that in a moment. So where x is closely embedded in x tilde and x tilde is smooth. So that's how you define it via Kashiwara's theorem. So now the question is, what is d modules on x tilde? This is defined well. x tilde is affine and smooth. There is the ring of differential operators. It's the derived category of all modules over this ring. But actually, you can also consider in terms of shapes, like either quasi coherent shapes. Well, I may. Quite quite yeah. cohomology, all of this should be equivalent. Yeah, I don't want. I don't even want to consider all sheaves. I, I never do it. So again, in the affine case, I take the ring and take modules. No, but in the usual algebraic geometry, that's for all the right d sub co of. So this means all sheaves with square cohomology. For some constructions, it's important because you can do good more resolution. To compute. I, I don't. I don't want to do it. That's that's how I define it. Just in my personal experience, in my lifetime, I've never seen the use in algebraic geometry of non, of, well, of non quasi coherent things. Well, I just said this to construct co car product using those models. You, you can do it in different ways. Just I, okay, so that's my that's my official definition. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's equivalent. It's definitely equivalent on d pluses. I, it, 
things might go wrong in D minus. I just don't know. As you just glued the right category using your fancy language. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I, and then I, then I glue it like this. So, um, so this is the drum pre stack. So this is one application, and now lock sys on anything. So lock sys g is this this mapping stack from x drum to point one g. So this is the official definition of lock sys. A D module on, on, a, on a stack, what is it exactly? Is there, no, but for example, uh, on a stack which is a reasonable stack, uh, a quotient of a scheme by a group, for example. Okay, first of all, you, first of all, you, first of all, you give a definition. The two, okay, so the, the two definitions, but they are they are very tautologically equivalent. So there's one. So let's just, I'm answering Lamont's question. So if Y is a stack. So we already have two definitions on the blackboard. On the one hand, D modules on Y can be defined as quasi-coherent sheaves on Y deram. That's definition one. Or you can glue. So define it as the limit over um, schemes of D modules on S. And those two are very tautologically equivalent. So by the way, here, Y doesn't have to be a stack. Again, Y can be a pre-stack. So Y can be an arbitrary pre-stack. In this case, uh, you, can, you can take arbitrary maps. If Y is smooth, it's enough to consider smooth guys. So these are two definitions. Now, in some particular cases, if y is the quotient of a, of a scheme by h, one can give a slightly more explicit description. So it's what you would call an h equivariant derived category on, on z. OK, so this is my log sys. Pardon me? No ring. no ring D, no. So the operations like tensor product over D or something? How there is no, I mean, there's no such thing as tensor product over D. There's operation of tensor product over O. Oh. Quasi co and anything mm -hmm. is a tensor category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over D is something else. It's the ROM cohomology. We'll go there, but it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a tensor structure. All right, so then, so one proves that if X is proper, then log sys G is an algebraic stack. I, let me not go into the proof. I just cannot do everything. So it's one of those things you can. There is a section in my paper with the Rinkin when we do these things in detail. And it is analytically isomorphic to the map from pi 1 to the other. Well, it's a stack. No, but I mean that's. If the points, oh, yeah. I mean, the points are what you think they are. Yeah, yeah it's. I'm just saying it in this way, just to how to set, set up definitions so that that makes sense within the right algebraic geometry. So I want that lox is B a functor. Oh, please. Yeah. Is it proper derived scheme or proper derived scheme? It, it, it doesn't matter because you see, once I take X derum, X derum doesn't feel any of the derived stuff. Yes, I work in characteristic zero. And you said that you have a reference? Yes, so this is, um, it's my paper with the Rinkin. 
uh, I think it's either section, I forget about the renumbering, it's uh, 10 or 11 somewhere. So it's It is derived. Yeah. So this thing, and it was Lamont's question earlier, it produces an object of derived algebraic geometry. You prove that it's, it's an algebraic stack, but you can ask, is it classical or not? So namely, when you smoothly cover it by an affine scheme, does this affine scheme have lower, does the structure shift, does the structure shift have lower cohomologies? The answer is yes, in general. Sometimes it does not. Like if the group is semi-simple and X is a curve is greater, gene is greater than one, it happens to be classical. In general, it's derived. And you will need these guys because in the process of proof, you'll use the stack for a Borel when, or you, the maximally unipotent when it's necessarily derived. So you can't. But not, not too badly, no? It's, a... um, it's always quasi-smooth, which is what I'm going to say now. So it's... it's, it's the, We'll, we'll see that in a, in a moment. It's quasi-smooth, but it's derived, so you cannot get away with classical stuff. Yes, so now let me say proposition that if X is a smooth curve, proper curve, um, log cis G is quasi-smooth. So let me give you kind of a token calculation how you do these things. So, well, for this to make sense, you have to first prove that it's, uh, it's algebraic stack, but that you prove by some very general arguments. This you prove by some very concrete arguments. You, you, you calc compute something. So what do you compute? Um, well, you have to compute the tangent space at points and see what cohomologies you, you're getting. So we actually gave the definition of rigorous definition within the derived algebraic geometry of um, the tangent space. So let me first do it in the arbitrary case for maps where x and y are just anything, even here, anything but we are within this local or finite type setting. Even here, you can, in the setting, you can compute completely tangent spaces. So if you fix a point, sigma, then the tangent will be this. These will be global sections on x of the pullback of the tangent on y. If you think about it, this is exactly what you expect, and that's, this is what you get within derived algebraic geometry. So again, no surprises, just that it makes rigorous sense. So in particular, and it's, it's a great exercise, just if you, if you want to acquire practical knowledge of how derived algebraic, algebraic geometry works, just do it. So if y is point mod g, we obtain the following description of ban g. Well, it's gamma. Okay, but now, so let's remember, what is the tangent space so I take this point of this stack. So therefore it makes sense to talk about the tangent space to the stack at this point. Who knows what that is, apart from those of you who know what it is. Yeah, Maxim, you are out. But um, who knows? Shifted by one. And if you look at what that is, so it'll be, you take this Lie algebra, you twist it by your bundle and shift cohomologically by one. And similarly, now you take x to be x dirham, so we take point mod g, 
but x the rum and the tangent to log cis and again for any x um, it will be what's known as the rum cohomology So in particular, so let me prove this proposition. So you've got this complex and all you have to see is that it doesn't have cohomologies higher than number one, but here we're dealing with a local system on the curve, local system shifted cohomologically by one. Well, on the curve you have cohomologies up to two, when you shift by one you have to up to one, period. So that's, that's the quasi-smoothness. So just, just the fact that H gamma Durham local system lives in degrees, degrees from zero up to two. So I just did it because it's a demonstration. So in derived algebraic geometry, some things you proved just by waving your hands, such as this, and some things you proved by some things you some things you proved kind of very concrete and hands-on way. So at the end of the day, when you have to compute something concrete, it comes down to something very very concrete. Yes, but that does not give you an easy way to see that, uh, for example, if genus is bigger than one, then the, it's locally complete intersection or something. Uh, no, th that you also prove. Mm. It, it doesn't give that. It doesn't give the classicality, right? Yeah, the, the fact that it's classical, you, yeah, that you prove it in some other way. Yeah. I think using kitchen map or something. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, in that book they do it. Okay. No, but in some sense, it's not completely miraculous. <laughs> it is. I mean, yeah, no, but I mean, you say the proof uh, that's enough. But uh, if you want, really want to to see more precisely what it means. It's yeah, yeah. It, so classicality of pre-stacks is usually hard. To, yeah, so if you want, so you got something as a pre you got, you got something like log cis, and then you ask, is it classical? And these questions are harder. Oh, because at the end, you, 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 your goal is to prove a theorem that demodule uh, yeah. de and bungee yeah. and uh, the O module on uh, Loxis are equivalent, but those two categories at the end, they are, uh, none of them is concrete in some sense. I mean, it's not so. Somehow it's fine. No, no, I yeah. understand, but I mean, at some point, uh, it doesn't mean much uh, if you. Okay, let's see. I mean. Yeah, okay. okay. In particular, I can now describe what sing of log cis is. Okay, so what did we say it was on any pre-stack? So it's an element sigma of your pre-stack and then an element of h minus one of the cotangent. So let's understand what this h minus one of the cotangent. So we take h one of the tangent And that was what? That's H2 on my curve with coefficient of the local system gotten as the twist of the Lie algebra by my local system. So now I want to dualize it. Let me lift this a little bit. Of the cotangent. Well, I have Verdier duality on the curve. And so what this will be, it will be H0 with coefficients in the dual Lie algebra, twisted by the same sigma. And now, it's H2 or it's sorry, Um uh, But now I'm going to use the killing form. But the, you see the group will be not less reductive. Uh, you're very right. This is where I stop if the group is not necessarily reductive. But in the reductive case, and we'll actually see 
we'll be dealing with parabolics in a moment. So that's where I stop. The group is non-reductive. If the group is reductive, I use the killing form to identify it with G. Thank you, Maxim. Pardon? Uh, it's fine because for what we want to do, it'll be up to homotheties, up to dilations. Okay, and why did I perform this? For the following reason. Okay, so now... We will not self use it because if the group is sum of a simple base, you can it, it, does, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, no, for what I'll say, it's not, that doesn't really matter. So I just want to draw your attention to what this thing is, if you look at it. If you have a local system, it has a group of automorphisms. And this is just its Lie algebra in the, very cl in the classical sense. So I want to call it sigma comma A, where A, let me just, by slight abuse of language, call it an endomorphism of sigma, by which I mean an element of the Lie algebra of the group of automorphisms. Right. Infinitesimal automorphism. Infinitesimal yes, I just want to call it this way. So you took H1 of T sigma and H minus 1 of T sigma star? Yeah, I mean dual, dual H1. So this was, this is the dual of this and this is the dual of this. The passage from here, pardon? No, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, the passage here is duality. So the passage from this line to this line is just dual, dualization. And the, these are dual by their duality. This is by definition the dual of this, and this happens to be the dual of this. Okay? Offer? Yeah, and it's compatible in the way it looks like the office of the Okay. No, but in particular, that means that if you take this edge zero, you can put that in family in some way. I mean, uh, the to there is a total space when you... Same. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's not obvious from the, at the beginning, no? Um, correct. Indeed. So, you're absolutely right. The top cohomologies are easy to put in the family, but not the... You're absolutely right. So, that means that it's, it's a it little bit mysterious. So. The totality of this is my thing. Okay, and now I can give the crucial definition. Well, right, notation. So NILP is a closed subset in this thing of Loxis, where we require A to be nilpotent. And, well, you can understand it many different ways. So, for example, A is a section of this thing, so it has a value at every point, and it's enough to require that it be nilpotent at just one point because it's, it, it's horizontal with respect to a connection. So, or it's global nilpotent, however you want to think about it. I don't give this definition. We'll, uh, I mean, we'll see non-reductive groups in a moment. It's just, I give the definition for the purposes of Langlands. And finally, so geometric Langlands is the following conjecture that d mod on Banji, haha, we actually define d modules. So we actually know what we're talking about. It's supposed to be equivalent to, well, Ind co nilp of loxis. Okay, so I'll give you an example of how this works, whether this is actually a theorem. So you are no, no, it's not necessarily on a curve. Or on... No, on a curve, yeah. It's, it's Langlands. Langlands has to do with curves. It's on curve. Yeah, okay. X. No, but. Uh, 
I mean, there are more because if you don't characterize this... Uh, oh yeah, of course. So... They could be equivalent. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's what I started for this first talk. <laughs> yeah, so I wrote a 100-page paper where I just listed all the things you want from this. Uh, so, and in my first talk, I said I only mentioned one thing, namely compatibility with mm, parabolic induction. That's this. It's it's only one thing. So, and given by a kernel. Uh, so, that's a question. Can we give object to the product? Right? Yeah. So, um, we work in the context of uh, co-complete categories and continuous functors. In this context, anything is given by a kernel. Yeah, but, uh, um, so it is given by a kernel. We don't um, kind of to understand this kernel is as difficult as to understand the, the conjecture itself. So, um, but you expect that there would be a nice kernel. I mean, I don't know what nice means. There is definitely a kernel. I don't know. For example, you can restrict it to open subset on both sides and uh, open substack. So, this kernel is not homologically bounded. So, um, so I don't know in what sense this kernel is nice. It's a kernel. Drinfeld has thought much more about this kernel. He w he wanted. Uh, so he was. Um, expecting the kernel to have very nice properties and just use them to prove it. I don't know to what extent. No, but to make the link to what you, for example, you have done for GLN in LADIC, in some sense, there is a kernel. Yes. Then, I mean, it would be nice to have a link. Uh, that link can be characterized differently. So that link is, mm, is Whittaker compatibility. So let me let me just say that this there's a bunch of things that you want this to to, to satisfy, uh, and again, so since I'm kind of I want to go into the direction of single support, let me just not go. I mean, the thing that is really relevant for single support is this parabolic induction. Somehow, all the other stuff, in a sense, it's more interesting because we're dealing with the cuspidal part of this category, but. The, what happens is the cuspidal part doesn't see this singular support problem. So the, the kind of the core, the meat of Langlands, uh, it's, uh, okay, let me just say, it. I, I think I said it the first, in my first lecture that like with automorphic forms, cuspidal automorphic forms are the most mysterious, but they don't present analytical problems. And here we're dealing with analysis. So that's why we're kind of we're dealing here with Eisenstein series. We just want to, these guys to converge somehow. Okay, so um, let me mention a few things. Remember, inside here we have Quasico. It's sitting there. So therefore, to it there corresponds something. Uh, quasi co is int co with a zero. So here the single support is ah, yes. the okay, perfect, complexes. perfect complexes. So, ah, okay. so here the single support is required to be nilp, but I can take the subcategory, the single support is zero. Mm -hmm. So it's our quasi co. Yeah? Remember we had this. Of int co. Remember we had this. We have this, so I'm considering this embedding now. So therefore, it corresponds to something. I'll call this something temp. For tempered, so what we can do, well, assuming the conjecture, you can intrinsically characterize what this subcategory is. 
So, you, so if the conjecture is true, you can say what this will go to. You do it in terms of Hecke functors. I will not do it right now. I will, I'm, I'll be very happy to do it in question time, but let me just not, not do it right now. It's kind of cool that you can geometrically say what temperedness means. And with the nilpotent cone, there is nothing. Pardon? With the nilpotent cone on this side. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Characteristic variety. Uh, so that, so that I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I, so, like here, you can restrict to um, the singular support in the d-module sense. You can try to see what is. I don't know. It's 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 a great question. Just I mean. It's, uh, it's great. So let me just say another thing that mm, is cool in the story. So as I said, this kind of theorem holds for log cis. So this int co is int of co. So, in, so compact objects are co-nilp. Um, now, as we shall see in the sequel, rather, as I shall state in the sequel. If you take um, on an arbitrary quasi-smooth stack, if you take... A, uh, yes, I, I know. Uh, if I take the category of coherent complexes with a given single support, there will be serodiality, auto-equivalence. So I wrote the same thing, but here it was an, with an op. Well, if we believe this conjecture, it's supposed to go take d modules in van G. So there must be an equivalence between the category of compact d modules and its opposite. Who can get what this equivalence is? Can you make a wild guess? Take compact objects of the category of D modules and try to make, make it contravariantly to itself and also involutively. Yeah, but I mean, we're talking about D modules. D modules, yeah, left D modules. We have evolution of potential bundle. No. So let me let me try to take some other answer because I think what you what you're trying to suggest has a name. It's called D. Capital D. Yes, it has it has a, it has a name attached to it. This mathematician's name. Who knows what I mean? Nobody wants. So if I take D modules, what? So if I take D modules on an algebraic variety take those which bound it with coherent cohomologies. I claim this category has an involution. Yeah, it's called Verdi duality. Yeah, but it does not, you don't have these. So. What do you mean? Oh, Verdi duality is something intrinsically defined. <coughs> yeah, it, so one way to define the affine case is, is our home to D, but you can, you can do it. In the context in which I define D modules, where the duality is. Makes sense? Yes. Even if there is loop? Pardon? Yes. Uh, I would be very tempted. Let me just give me, give me a second. Um, okay, here is how it's defined. So. But you have this business of going from left to right and so on? Uh, no, 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 no. You don't need any of that. Just give, give me one moment. I'm just trying to think if I can do it. Um, Really easily. This is a tensor with omega. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. So, just aside, home from d f one to f two is Durham cohomology on. D mod Y. So this this would this would ver, what Verdi duality is. Okay. 
OK, but that's not the problem. So you want to say that it's Verdier, but this, is, this happens to be completely wrong. And uh, let me just say one word. It's Verdier up modulo, a very cool correction that was invented by Drinfeld. So what happens is this. So let me s describe how compact objects on Bungie look like. So here, we're really getting into analysis. So the problem is Bungie is not quasi-compact. Well, we know it from automorphic forms, the fundamental domain. So compact objects in D mod Bungie look as follows, all. You take a quasi-compact open, call it U. You take a compact guy on U and shriek extended. So now there is a problem. It's the shriek extension of D modules in the non-holonomic setting is not always defined. So it may or may not be defined. So there's a theorem that there is enough of such U's and FU's such that these guys are defined and they compactly generate the category. So it's a, it's a result of some content. So this means uh, supported by you in some way? Or? Well, you is open. Yeah, yeah, no, but okay, I know, but I mean, uh, that means that... Uh... Yeah, it's extension by zero from you. So it's, one, it's easy to show that whenever we have a non-quasi-compact algebraic stack, compact objects must be of this form. So the Dorf Derived stokes outside of uh, the star fibers outside of star fibers outside of quasi compact must vanish. You necessarily have that. It's it's not true that an arbitrary non quasi compact algebraic stack the category will be compactly generated. You might not have enough of these guys, but it so happens that specifically for Bungie, reduction theory tells you that there are many of these guys. So the category is actually compactly generated. So but you said that the J lower shriek is not necessarily defined? Yes, as you know, for non-holonomic D modules, J lower shriek may not be defined. You mean the shriek in the D module theory sense? Yes. So it is usually the dual of the J lower star of the dual? Exactly. The left adjoint may not be defined. J lower shriek is the left adjoint to restriction. And this left adjoint may not be defined. The left adjoint in the quasi coherent or coherent? Again, it's, I'm, I'm in my setting, but it's, yeah, in the quasi-coherent, if you wish, right. And so there is no good uh, local description, because it is not always. Yeah, so I'm saying it, it, not for every U and FU it will be defined, but sometimes it's defined. Let me, let me give an equivalent. Um, Caspedol will be compact in some. Ah, caspedals, for caspedals it will be fine. So let me, uh, let, me, let me comment on this. Let me, I'll, I'll say one thing and then I'll, I'll go back to Cuspidals. Um, so I'll, offer, I'll answer your question as, as follows. A parallel phenomenon for this not always be defined is the following, that you can take J lower star and if Fu was compact, this guy may, may no longer be compact. In fact, it may no longer be coherent. So it was, this was coherent, this will become quasi-coherent. So you lose this finite generation, obviously. When you do J lower star, you lose finite generation. It just so happens that Bungie is structured in such a way that there are many use for which you will not lose this finite generation. But whatever happens, if you apply Verdier duality to this guy, what you will get is J lower star of the Verdier dual of U. 
And this is a problem if you, if you believe into anything like this. Because, okay, this was compact, you apply verticality, but this is no longer compact. G these GLO shrieks that are compact, these guys are no longer compact. So this just has no, no chance of being true. Verticality does not send compact guys to compact guys. So what Drinfeld invented, he, he introduced another explicit integral operator, he called it miraculous duality, that... Um, it was recently it's not by Yarchenko, it's himself. Yeah, in the function theoretic setting. So he introduced a, a functor given by explicit kernel that sends star extensions to freak extensions. So it's, it's, it's very cool stuff. Um, that said, let me go back to Cuspidal. So for Cuspidal, one proves the following. There exists a particular open subset such that anything which is Cuspidal is what's called clean. It's both star and shriek ext extension. Yeah. Also, this miraculous duality acts as identity on Cuspidals. So it doesn't do anything to the Cuspidals but does something very weird to Eisenstein, namely this miraculous reality, they call it mirror. It sends eyes, there are two versions of Eisenstein's functors, one with a shriek, another is a star. It sends eyes with a star to eyes with a shriek, but for the opposite parabolic. So this is mirror. So, so he introduced this magic trick. All right. Um, and so the conclusion is that uh, which form talk correspond to com 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 composition of verdi duality and, and mirror. What do you like mirror i plus is equal to i? So, so there are two versions of Eisenstein's functors because you can pull back with a star, pull forward with a shriek, or pull back with a shriek and push forward with a star. So mirror turns eyes one version to another version, but for the opposite parabolic. It's some very weird version of the functional equation, if you wish. Okay, so I guess I'm still running behind the time. I still haven't covered the material of my first talk. I don't know what's going on. Um, so let's have a break. No, it was supposed to contain everything if I covered all that I wanted to cover. You have 4,000. Yes. Okay, next hour I'll speak twice as fast, okay? <laughs> Joking. Single support started because there wasn't a bug in the naive formulation, and, the, and this bug was most visible. Uh, with Eisenstein series. Let me try to explain how this bug get corrected via this theory. I will give exactly half of the explanation and the other half will, will be next week. So, we are considering loxis P mapping to loxis M. I call it Q spectral. So the problem, so was, so we consider the following functor. So the spectral Eisenstein series. We pull back, and then push forward. Okay, so here there's some dangerous notation, this upper shriek. It shouldn't be taken for granted. But please do for now, and we'll, we'll spend some time next week explaining what it is. So the shriek pullbacks are, it's a theory with content. So we'll talk about it. But so what we want, we want that to send int co nilp 
log sys m check m Well, to do this, I have to talk a little bit about the sing of this guy. So how does sing of loxis p look like? Well, it's a local system with respect to p, I'll call it sigma p. Well, it's supposed to be h0 of p dual twisted, but of course, as Maxim noted, there's no killing form on p, but there is a killing form on g. So, P dual identifies with G modulo the unipotent radical of P. The killing form on G does this. So, so, A will be an element of this, twisted by sigma. And notice that Inside G mod independent radical of P, there is P modulo independent radical of P, and that is M, the Levy. So inside here there is M twisted by sigma, and inside here there is you can take the nilpotent elements in M. And so and this is what I call well for the parabolic. This is what I call nilp. Uh, I wanted to know about the independence of the choice of the parabolic in this functor. Choice of the parabolic? Yeah. You mean in the conjugacy class? No, for example, about this functor, how much it depends and you choose a different parabolic. Oh, with, with the same levy? Oh, yeah, it depends. Yeah, it's, it definitely depends. There's a beautiful story about that. I just, well, again, I'll be happy to talk about it maybe later. So, uh, nilp is these guys. So, it's nilpotent inside the levy. Okay, let me just say, and I'll explain it next time, that this functor, which in itself is suspicious, sends intco. Uh, nilp loxis m nilp loxis p so if you wish proposition proposition a and b is that this functor and not only intco it and preserves compactness These are different statements. One is preserves compactness doesn't have to do with single support. It, it can be measured in the, in the entire category. And all it says is that this functor maps coherent to coherent. And that has to do with the fact that this map is itself quasi smooth. So in particular, finite or dimension, it pull, pulls back coherent to coherent. B is that P spec lower star sends now this category int code and preserves coherence. Again, preservation of coherence has nothing to do with singular support. It can be measured on all, all, all of int co, and all it says that it sends co to co, and it's just because this morphism is proper. It's just the properness. The kind of the interesting thing is that it does this to singular supports, and I'll actually show where this comes from. So if, if I don't run out of time, we'll explain this. today.
and this next time. Let me say also more. So I wanted to explain that. So why do, why do we think that this is the right formulation, not something else? I wanted to explain that this is kind of the minimal fix for the conjecture if you wanted to be non-self-contradictory with Eisenstein series. So kind of, if you wish, the main theorem of our paper with Arinkin is the following, that do the following, do this Eisenstein functors, but apply them not to, to the smaller category. Don't apply them to the enlargement. They do them naively. Apply to quasico log cis m. So you get something smaller. You will land into intco nilpov log cis. Do it for all parabolics and then see what it generates inside intco. The claim is that it actually generates intco nilp. All parabolics including G, obviously. So in a sense, it's a minimal fix. Um, you have fixed a, a no, but what, here you have fixed a Levy or not? No, I'm I'm going through conjugate a class of parabolics. No, no, but here uh, when you say you you have a map. Uh, no, it Levy is always the quotient for me. Always a quotient. Yeah, uh, inside uh, here it's P uh, more than P. P. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the link between the nilp of M and P and G uh, is probably ge completely geometric. You mean why, why I, I define this? There is a geometric link between them. I mean, you can go, I mean, like for... Uh, uh, I ask you, where does this come from? Yes, there is, there is a, a very geometric uh, sense behind, I mean. Yeah, and I will explain them, yeah. Okay, so now I want to do an example of P1, how things looks like. In which case, this, this statement is, is a theorem. Okay. Question to the audience. How does log cis G on P1 look like? Who knows? Yeah, you know that it's someone else as a derived stack. What is G? Uh, redu reductive. Uh, it doesn't matter, any connected group, actually. So how many local systems are there on P1? Yes. So what do you think the stack? And how, what, what are the automorphisms? Well, it's not. So the claim is that its point, the way it looks is this. You're taking my favorite derived scheme, point times point over G, and divided by G. It has non-trivial uh, DG derived structure. Again, um, I'll be very happy if you ask me how to prove this, but after, in the question time. It's a lovely exercise, hands-on exercise, how you prove such a thing in derived algebraic geometry. Yeah, yeah, it's acting, it's acting a joint on G, and of course acting to be on the point. So G, if this is the Lyagible down? Yes. So the Lyagible view is in the fine space? Yes. You take, so... You take the derived product? Take the derived product, it's acted on by G, acting, uh, and then it's a stack, it's a stack quotient. But you can write a complex in some... I can, yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah. It would be nice. <laughs> I mean, for, for the algebra of functions? Well, yeah, yeah, something. You, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do it very explicitly in a moment. Uh, 
So let me just state that this looks like this, and again, I'll be happy to prove it for you. It's, it's very nice. We like this formulation, but... Uh... <laughs> no, I'll, and there is a reason. Okay, so Langlands... That means if you trivialize... Uh, I mean, there is a, a stack above where you, t you kill the G. Yes. So that means you have a map of pawn times pawn. Yeah, that stack is just take uh, local systems where you, tri you trivialize the fiber at one point. At a point. At one point. Yeah. By the way, this is not completely canonical. This actually depends on the choice of a point on the. Yeah, it's. Yeah, it's not. It's, it depends on choices, yeah. on P1. But in any case, Langlands. So that's what it says int co nilp but we've been through this causal duality game already so this category is the following you're taking algebra sim of g shifted cohomologically by 2 to the right you're taking modules you're taking single support on nilpotent cone in the sense of commutative algebra, and you're taking the equivariant category. Okay, so unfortunately I placed it. Let me temporarily remove it because I want to put something here. I want to prove, put my favorite int co without support connected by these pair of adjoint functors, and this will be sim no support condition. Again, this is the obvious embedding, just this thing's with support, sits inside all things, and this is, pardon? Where? Here. Yes. And this is the right adjoint, namely take sections supported. And inside here, we have quasi-co. Um, and this is, this is stuff supported at zero. By the way, so the way that, so the reason that such an equivalence exists is, well, there was experimental evidence of Bezrukovnik of Finkelberg and independently Vincent Laforgue, and then if you look closely, you would arrive exactly to this formulation. Okay, now here comes the question. I want to say what this equivalence. Sorry, this is this is Langlands dual. So here comes the question. I want to understand what this equivalence actually does. So on the geometric side, I'll take the following very concrete object. You know that band G on P1 contains point mod G as an open substack. These are the semi-stable locus. Yeah? The trivial bundle is an open condition. Take the following thing on the, on the left. J lower shriek of your well, constant D module. Now what? This deserves a better place than... I don't know what to do. I'll erase this theorem. And I'll tell you where it goes to under Langlands. So, as the diagonal morphism of the point. After all, 
before you divide by G, it's a derived scheme, blah, blah, blah. It has one point. Just map this point in. Let me call it I. It's a diagonal map. By the way, I'm currently testing the level of alertness. Something on the left of, of what's written on the blackboard makes no sense. Can you, can you tell me what makes no sense? Yeah, I claim this is very ambiguous. Okay, because you can actually understand in many different ways. And this is what I, I said early on, that you can really get confused when you use this function sigma and psi, kind of embedding intco, quasi co inside intco, viewing as a quotient. So here is one way. So I want this to live here. I mean, that's where it's supposed to live. Point. But let's see what meanings I can assign to this object. On the one hand, after all, it's a quasi-coherent sheaf. I took the direct image of one quasi-coherent sheaf under another. On the one hand, I can understand it as an object here. And this is a wrong answer. Because kind of this would have corresponded to something tempered, and this guy is not tempered. So that's not what we want. So this object does not belong to this category. Here's another possibility. You would agree that this guy is a coherent sheaf. Coherent? Sure. It lives here, therefore. But it doesn't belong to this subcategory. So the way to understand it is you take, interpret it as a coherent sheaf and apply this right adjoint. By the way, as a coherent sheaf, it corresponds to the structure sheaf, to sim. It's not supported on the nilpotent cone. You have to apply this right adjoint. No, but uh, I don't know star, what does it mean exactly? Because on, on what, on so the yeah. source, you have a, a regular stack. On the target, you have a derived stack. But exactly. they are the same, uh, essentially the same uh, classically. In some yes, and I'll draw a diagram in a moment where such a thing will, in general, be explained. I will write it in a, in a second. Um, I'm saying that when I write I lower star, and I'll do it, I'll go there in a moment, it's ambiguous. I don't want to understand it here. I do want to understand it here, and then apply the right adjoint. So the answer, J lower shriek of the constant, goes to this thing, take, take the skyscraper, apply the right adjoint. So now we'll destroy my conjecture. We'll arrive to a contradiction in mathematics. Not in mathematics, but with my conjecture. Great. OK, so how does this thing look like? As I said, let me go to Kozul dual side. You took the structure sheaf, and you, then you took cohomology with supports on the closed variety. And you're not getting something coherent, right? Like imagine a smooth variety, you take homology with supports at the point, you'll get the kind of delta function. Not the skyscraper, but the whole delta function. It's not coherent. Agreed? Maxim. Again, take, smooth, take a smooth variety, take a point. Pardon me? Six and O is equated here. No, no, no. Uh, Coherent modules means like finely generated cohomology. So the cohomology is not finely generated. So we've got, if it were here, it would be com compact. Once I apply this right adjoint, it stops being compact. So this is no longer compact. But if the conjecture is true, well, I earlier described how compact objects look like. So I took this guy, constant sheaf. What's, what's the problem? Yes. On the classifying stack, the constant sheaf is not compact. Classifying stack has, in, has you know, 
equivariant cohomology of the group is infinitely many degrees, the constant sheaf is no longer compact. So this guy is not compact here. So no contradiction. Now let me modify. Uh, instead of doing this, let me call it J tilde. Map from the point. So what was your conjecture that you were trying to... No, I, it, was a, it was a joke. I was saying that we ran into a contradiction in mathematics. Because I, I said that this guy on the right hand side is not compact, but note that the guy on the left is not compact either. Oh, okay. Because on the classifying stack, yeah. this constant shift is not compact. Instead, you can modify, consider the map from the point to the classifying stack, and take the constant shift there and map it maybe to the classifying. So it's something whose fibers are the cohomology of the group. And this is compact now. Pardon? So I'm, and what it will correspond to the, on the other side, so let me say j lower shriek of pi lower shriek of k. So it will correspond to something which is supposed to be compact. I don't know how to describe it here, but I know how to describe it here. This is the structure shift of the nilpotent cone. Not very surprisingly. Kind of, I'm killing off the um, equivariant cohomology of the group. So, in terms of this equivalence, in terms of this causal duality, it will be the structure shift of the nilpotent cone. All right. And so for each Chardon Arashiman there is For each Chardon Arashiman stratum, there is a guy. There's, there's a guy, there's a guy there. Yes, I, I'm blanking now on the descriptions on the spectral side. That means that uh, uh, there is a connection with the Kajan Lustig. Okay, so here is my piece of ignorance, but maybe it's not, not just mine. As far as I know, the Cardinalistic polynomials on Banjiu P1 are not known. Yeah, okay. No, but I mean, uh, there, is a, there is something similar on the other side. So, let me say that I think this is not well investigated. Yeah. So, we understand this equivalence, but there is a bunch of things that, are, that remain open. For example, interpret the Cardinalistic polynomials in terms of the langlands dole group. I don't think this is known. Okay, so I'm, one, I'm half an hour behind my schedule. So there were two things that I was planning to do, but I think I can only do one. One was the actual definition of single support. I, give you the, I gave you this pointwise definition, but there's a more powerful definition in terms of uh, Oxford cohomology. That's option one. Option two would be to discuss this lower star business and explain, explain this. So you'll have to accept the definition of singular, the existence of singular support, and I'll explain where such things come from, that the direct image sends this to this. So what are the preferences? That means you, there is a link between the, the two nilpotent cores. Yes. Okay, so that's it. it should be not so difficult. Okay, maybe I'll explain this first. Okay. At least it is concrete. Yeah. Okay, so. Pardon? No, I don't need Lurie's book. Uh, we are pretty much done with Lurie's book. It's like, it's always, it's in the beginning, and then you can put it aside, and then you. Okay. Suppose you have a map between just schemes, a quasi-smooth scheme. Uh, no, schemes. 
locally finite type. What I want to define, so on the one hand, we have f lower star from quasi co So I claim there exists another functor that goes from I'll define what this functor is. It's kind of stupid. For some reason it works and it makes the entire thing work. Before I define this functor, I'll tell me I'll tell you what property it has and what property it does not have. The only thing is that I should have written this line below. So this will be the functor that I will define. And this is the functor that we already have. Okay, the property that it will have is that this diagram will commute. Remember, it's this right adjoint. The property that it will not have is that this diagram, well, let me say it, if the schemes were eventually co-connective, we also have these functors in the opposite direction, and this diagram will not commute. So let me just cross this out. And so that's one point when one can get really confused. So, you see, there are, there are two ways to go from quasi-coherent sheaves on S1 to incoherent sheaves on S2. You can take the quasi-coherent direct image and then embed, or you can embed and then take incoherent direct image. And these are different, and that's what we saw with this delta function and kind of. And we can even turn around and you get two maps. All right, so now let me tell you how this functor is defined. It's very stupid, unfortunately. So to define, remember, incoherent sheaves was incompletion of something. I have to define just a functor from here to here. And it's defined as follows. I embedded into quasi-coherent sheaves, but I remember that it goes to the plus part. Then I apply the usual push forward. I go to quasi coherent sheaves as two plus part. And then I remember, all right, these guys were actually equivalent. And then I embedded. Uh, oh, is, oh, it's standard notation. Um, to the right, yeah. Yeah, bounded, how do you say from it? Below. Bounded from below. Okay, so now let me comment on where such things come from. So if you have a map from S1 to S2, well, there's the co differential. There is this diagram. Just taking the dual of the differential of the map. In particular, you could take h minus 1, and then define the map, a correspondence, if you wish, like this. Uh, 
and we call this map sing of f. So here is the theorem. So the, there's this one theorem for star pullbacks, and it will be a parallel theorem for shriek pull star push forwards, and there will be a parallel theorem for shriek pullbacks that I'll discuss next time. It says this that fix n1 in sing s1 and fix n2 in sing s2. And now assume the following that if you take the pre image under this of n1, then it will be contained in this. Kind of estimate from below, like the n1 thing is smaller than something that has to do with n2. Then the claim is that this int co sends int co n1 of s1 to int co n2 s2. So you can see the f f will start at some stage. That's in the code without support convention. No. Uh, see my conventions. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's this new funky f lower star. Yeah, which which you don't care about support condition. In this case. Support and one. Yeah. 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 So f lower yeah. It's a full subcategories. Full subcategories. It maps. Yeah. So sorry, Maxim. No, no, that's the thing. It doesn't map compact objects to compact objects, mm -hmm. but it maps a given subcategory to... But in your application? You need... In my application, it's actually proper. So in addition to that, it actually maps co to co. Yeah, yeah. OK. So you just... Yeah. Why it's something more general that you need? But I need that anyways yeah. for many different things. So again, let me just disambiguate, as Maxim just remarked. This function is defined a priori from int co all supports of S1 to int co all supports in S2. The claim is that this functor sends this subcategory to this subcategory. It's kind of estimate from, from above. This is exactly the same when for D module, except you replace H0 by H minus 1. Yeah, yeah. So there are these kind of similarities, but I don't, I do, I don't, I don't know how to make them more precise. Now, it's a great exercise. Apply this theorem to get proposition point A. Uh, you need also uh, for the uh, upper sh point? sorry uh, point B uh, point, point B for point A we'll do it next time. Um, so just exercise deduce proposition B from theorem. The unipotent radical is contained in the unipotent. Yeah, yeah. If you take, if you take something in the parabolic, which is unipotent module unipotent radical, then it was in, unipotent. Yeah. Again, this is not. <laughs> See, kind of. At the end, it's all very concrete. <laughs> All right, so now it's, it remains some time. I can try to say how we actually define single support. So this point-wise thing is not really manageable. So one has to give a more robust definition. So do people still have energy for 15 minutes? We can call it a day. No, OK, let me do it. Just feel free to go to sleep. No, I, I'll. I'll survive. Um, all right. So the framework is this. And for this framework, you actually don't need higher, higher categories. So this, it's kind of triangulated. So T is a triangulated category, and A is a positively graded algebra, commutative algebra.
that maps to the graded center of A, of T. That what I mean by this is that for every element, homogeneous element A of degree N, you get a functor from T to, sh to T shifted by 2N. And these guys commute with each other for different A's. Yes, and commute with natural transformation, maps to the center, so natural. So if you map from T to T prime, the, the diagram commutes. So, so consider spec A. And for each element, homogeneous element A, we denote by Y sub A, so this kind of locus of zeros. So algebra is graded to kind of plane graph, not in the super sense. Yeah. Uh, even, we kind of think it evenly graded. Yeah. So you see it. Yeah, so n goes to, gives the shift by 2n. Think of it as evenly graded. It's a matter of convention. So, um, what I'll do, I'll define a category for each a. I'll denote it, let's call it, well, spec a minus ya. These will be things supported away, not supported, on the open subset away from the zeros of a. Namely, t belongs to this subcategory if this map is an isomorphism. It's a subcategory. I wrote it in such a weird way that it stands on the right be because this it will admit a left adjoint. And we get this, what you can call it, exact sequence of categories. Namely, you define things with support on YA to be those guys that are get, get killed by this functor. And you really should think of these are objects supported set theoretically on YA, and this, this is its right orthogonal. So in fact, you can write down this um, left adjoint explicitly, call it localization A. Pardon? Yeah, so uh, my category is co-complete. So. So, this log A of T defined as follows. It's this homotopic co-limit, which are usually not defined in triangular categories, but they're defined if you're taking it over natural numbers. So, in other words, you're taking the lim let's say, Yeah, these are these animals are not rare. It's like like a house mouse. 
okay, so, so this means that this is the subcategory of objects defined on zeros of A. Now, you, if you have N is a risky closed in spec A, you define Tn as the intersection of all the A's such that N is contained in Ya of T sub Ya. So that's how you define support. And there is, so what you want to see that it really works like support for quasi kirin sheaves. And there's one thing to check there. So it's not completely tautological. There's one thing that needs to be checked, and that is that this containment is an equality. You don't need any extra assumptions, it just follows as is, but it's like the first thing where, which is not completely automatic. You do, you do something to prove it. And then, so this gives you a well-defined mm, notion of support. So now, what do we apply it to? So S is quasi-smooth. But TYA is not a subcategory of something? What means intersection? Oh, they are. They are subcategories. Uh, TN is... Oh, T... No, no, but, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's your diagram. There is, no, no, but uh, because, because on the, the diagram yeah, there is yeah. an inclusion which is not there. Ah. No, sorry, this is really bad no, no, no. typo. So this is... Um, Quotient thing. This this is inclusion. These are really things with support. So T is, if you wish, the triangulated category corresponding to int co. So int co was this DG thing. We don't care about it anymore. We're taking the corresponding triangu triangulated category. Now, who is A? Before I define A, I'll define what comes before A? B. And, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. So, for this definition, we don't even need Hochschild co-chains. We just take Hochschild cohomology as is, as is. Now, so let's notice what we have in there. So, in Cohomology. It's something that acts. So into zeroth Hochschild cohomology, we have, you take one thing you know that functions on your variety map into, well, even Hochschild co-chains take the zeroth cohomology of that and you have the zeroth cohomology of your functions like map to Hochschild co-chains, uh, Hochschild cohomology. Another thing that you know, well, you need to know a little bit about how, how Hochschild co-chains look like. So if you take sections of this shifted tangent, well, that actually maps to Hochschild, sorry, I should write Hochschild cohomology. So this moves, this maps to Hochschild co-chains of S. In particular, uh, H1 maps to 
the second Hochschild cohomology. And it maps as a module over this. And as a result, if you have this and this, if you take the symmetric algebra of this over this, it is by definition the algebra functions on my sing. So we obtain that sing was this classical scheme maps to and this is my A. So in this story you really haven't used Hauschild cochains, but you will use them. And see there are different degrees of heaviness with which you can use them. For most applications, like if you want to compare with my point-wise definition, you only need Hochschild cochains as an associative differential graded algebra. In fact, Hochschild cochains have more structure. They are what's called an E2 algebra. And you can get away without using it. It's much more convenient to use it for some applications, but you actually don't need to know what E2 algebras is, what E2 algebras are to develop the theory. All right.